Hello, I'm Uncle David, and it's really a privilege for me to be here with you today. We have a very, very solemn, a very important subject. I do not feel worthy really to present it, but I believe that you will be greatly blessed today. And, and as we go forward, uh, I believe that more and more voices around the world will be sharing this message, and you'll hear it from many different directions. Before we open God's Word and, and study these things, we need to pray that God will uh, lead us and guide us that his word will be heard, not the speaker, but that the Holy Spirit will present his message. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we live in this last generation. Thank you that we can be witnesses to these last day events and that you are revealing line upon line as events happen. You're showing your people what is happening how to understand what is happening, how to prepare for the future and prepare for the special anointing, the sealing and the loud cry. Oh, how we need your Holy Spirit. Prepare our hearts. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And may you pour out your spirit now as we open your word and discuss these events so that we may be wise and the wise will understand, the wicked will not understand, but we want to be wise and we need your Holy Spirit to illuminate us. Give us wisdom today because those that ask will receive abundantly, we pray and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Hello, I'm Uncle David. I am very delighted to be with you today. But I'm kind of scared because the subject today is probably one of the subject matters, the most solemn that I've ever preached, the most urgent, the, the, the one with the biggest consequences. It's about a door which is about to close very soon to the Advent people. And the question is, are you ready? And the, the subject of this whole matter is about the urgency of the times that we live in. Before I begin the subject, I would like to make a disclaimer. What the subject matter is about. What I'm trying to say, what I wish to communicate, is that over the last several months, uh, the Lord, actually over several years, but the last several months, he has focused my attention on several things that I came to the realization that this has to be presented to you, to the people, to those that are awaiting Jesus' second coming, those that understand the sanctuary service. It has to be presented so that there, there's time to react so that there's time to study and pray. There is time to get ready. It will identify parallels in history, history of several key players, and it will identify the parallels of previous events, historical events, with what is happening today. God has impressed me, shown me, that those events in the past will be perfectly replicated. Uh, will be duplicated in like manner and that God's people need to know about them so they can be wide awake and preparing. What I'm not trying to say, and without a doubt some people will say that I am, but I want to say ahead of time, what I'm not trying to say, I'm not trying to communicate a specific date, I'm not trying to communicate a specific um, event that will happen on a specific day, month, but I am trying to communicate exactly what Jesus told us to do, to communicate when it's even at the door. And we are at the door. It is my conviction after much prayer and consultation with colleagues, with an, another pastor, I spent about an hour with another pastor who from a very different point of view has also reached the same conclusion. Uh, some of our workers, some friends and others have also had confirmation in dreams which, has, which woke me up to the importance of what was happening. And it, I began to research. I began to understand. So I'm not trying to set any dates, yet I am trying to say that we are even at the door. And that is what God intended for us to do. And we will see during this study that 
It is God's intention that his people are aware of how close we are and how near to the closing of that door when God's people are to get ready for the final exam, which is coming about to soon to burst like a surprise upon the world. So please, I make this disclaimer uh, ahead of time. I'm not trying to set any dates, but I am trying to communicate the parallels that are happening and which gives us an idea of how close we are to Jesus coming, uh, the exact timing God will reveal to us. And I am not being dogmatic either. I'm not saying that I know 100%, but I cannot but communicate what I have seen, what I have heard, what I have observed, and the convictions. Not to communicate this to you could mean that your blood will be on my hands, and I don't want that to be the case. So I'm communicating what God has uh, showed me, and I believe that since this is God's uh, message for this time, for this very moment in history, I believe that God will confirm it through many voices. Soon we will be hearing this message from others in South America, Africa, Asia, and Europe. I believe God has already started, and I believe it's all, I am not the only one. Already I know about three or four people that have come to the same conclusion, and so I believe it's going to grow into a mighty message that will alert God's people to the nearness of time. So let's, let's get on with the message, but I wanted to make that very clear. And even though I, I make it clear, I know that some people will still state that I am doing it, and I am willing to take that, that chance and that risk, but I pray that if you are honest in heart, you will understand the meaning of the message, and then you will take it directly to the Lord, and through prayer and study, you yourself will reach to your own conclusions. As a watchman on a wall, we are called upon to sound the warning whenever there's danger. A faithful watchman must give the message. In Ezekiel 3, 17 to 18, we are told, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman on the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. If thou givest not the warning, his blood will I require at thine hand. This is a very sacred responsibility to be a watchman. Actually, every Seventh-day Adventist is supposed to be a watchman but especially those that are awake and can see what is happening need to sound a warning. We will see what happens when you don't sound a warning. In, in Israel's ancient times and even today, God has this problem. Watchmen that never warn. They are placed as watchmen on the walls of Zion, but this is what happens. They won't speak, they won't hear, they won't see what is happening. Isaiah 56, 10 to 11 says, his watchmen are blind. They're all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough. They all look to their own way, everyone for his own gain from his quarter. There are watchmen on the walls that are dumb dogs and cannot bark. There are many watchmen on the walls that cannot bark. Why? For various reasons. Perhaps they're afraid of losing their job. Perhaps they're afraid of what people will say. But the blood of the innocent will be on their hands and God will hold them responsible. I do not want anybody's blood on my hands. In fact, I would want to see those that are saved and are ready because of this sermon. So I pray God will use it, not because I have something to say, because God has something to say. Uh, there are no surprises for those who are watching. In fact, there are several uh, very clear Bible verses that will show us what God expects of us. For example, Amos 3, 7, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he first revealeth it to his servants, the prophets. Nothing means nothing. It means, that, it means that God will always, always warn when he's about to do something. And he will always make sure that we're aware. He will never catch us by surprise if we're awake. Now, if you're sleeping, there are many things that will come like an overwhelming surprise. Of course, 1 Thessalonians 5, 4, said, But ye, brethren, are not of darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. We will see that here also. And God does not want to overtake us as a surprise, unless we're in darkness. Joel 2, 28, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. We are living at a time when God is already giving dreams and visions and talking to people, older people and young people. This is his promise. We do have the spirit of prophecy, and Sister White was, was blessed as our messenger from the Lord with a massive lifetime of uh, prophetic messages and light from heaven. But that doesn't mean that 
Some of us will not receive the Holy Spirit in visions and dreams as well. In fact, one of the reasons I'm preaching this is because that is exactly what has happened. Several of my friends that I deeply trust spiritually have told me the, uh, the communications they have received in dreams, and they have a history of God communicating through dreams. God is communicating with the Muslim people in dreams everywhere. The Holy Spirit is at work today, and all of these messages, those that must be tested by the, they all have to be tested by the Bible, and if they're tested and conform, then you, we can have confidence in, uh, in them. In 1 Corinthians 10, 11, now all these things happen unto them for examples and are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. The Apostle Paul is telling us here that, uh, that everything that happened in the past is to be an example. We're to study it because it's written for us that live in the last days. It should not surprise those at all when, when events are repeated because that's why God is asking us to look at the past so we can see what is going to happen in the future. Look at, look at Matthew 24. Uh, 32 to 33. Now learn the parable of fig tree. Jesus said, when his branch is yet tender and it putteth forth its leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when you see all these things, you know that is, it is nigh, near, even at the doors. So Jesus wants us to, to be aware. He wants us to watch. He wants us to see the development of things. The problem is that we become so accustomed to thinking someday, 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 that we cannot ourselves uh, uh, we, we'll, we're surprised. In fact, those that have never heard the message are less likely to be pessimistic about the message than those of us that have heard it all our life. We've been vaccinated uh, to a certain extent by hearing a message so many times that we don't even listen to it anymore. But this time, it is serious. This time, we will find out that God is making his move. And you have to make some decisions. I have to make some decisions. Mark 13, 35. Watch ye therefore... For you know not when the master of the house cometh, even at, at even, midnight, cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. He's talking to his own people. Could it be that many of us are still sleeping? In fact, the ten virgins, we will find out a little bit later, the ten virgins are a perfect example of God's people. Even if they have oil in their lamp, they are still sleeping. Even if you're faithful, and even if you're allowing God to live in you, and, to, and you've committed your life to the Lord, you could be sleeping so that the event will catch you by surprise. So that's why we have some people giving the message, the midnight cry, the bridegroom is coming. Let us go forth to meet him. First Thessalonians 5.4 But ye, brethren, are not of darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. It is not God's purpose to overtake us. Look, at, who can understand these things? Who can understand current events? Here we are told who can understand. Those who place themselves under the control of God to be led and guided by him will capture the steady tread of events as he ordains them to take place. In, in Christian Service, page 77, those who place themselves under the control of God will understand what is happening. And in, in Daniel 12, we are told that the, the wicked will not understand, but the wise will understand. We certainly want to be wise. That's why we are watching this video. That's why we're producing this video. That's why you're there, is because we want to understand. In order to understand what is happening, we have to understand who the key players are. There are some certain key prophetic figures that we have to keep our eyes on. In order, when they make their move, we know something is happening. When God allows them to make their move, because God is the one who overrules in the affairs of men, and he is the one who determines when and what happens. And when he allows things to move forward on earth, it means that we can know that something is happening in heaven. One of the key players is Papal Rome. Paper Rome is the beast, the harlot of Revelation 13, 17 through 19. She is drunk with the blood of the saints. The deadly wound that was, that was uh, applied to the beast in 1798 has now been almost healed. And all the world is wondering after the beast. It is not fully healed yet, but it is almost. And we will find that very, very soon. In a matter of a short time, it will be fully healed. The, the papal power will be given power for 42 months to be able to, to, be able to uh, make war with the saints and to overcome them. We were thinking 42 months, prophetic months, that happened the 1260 years in the past. But we will find that God has always been able and used dual applications 
throughout its uh, prophecy, like the seven churches represent seven literal churches, but also seven periods of time. And we could go with several examples of this. And, and we, will, uh, we will find that there is a period in prophecy that is both literal, like uh, this, uh, Daniel 12, and also symbolic of the past. One is to show us what happened in the past, and one is to give us a literal understanding of the events as they happen one after the other in the future. There will be a massive war against God's people, and this power, Papal Rome, will be given power to make war and to overcome the saints to the point of uh, even martyrdom. Another key player is the United States. If we keep our eye on Rome and what Rome is doing, and we know that the second beast, the lamb-like beast, the United States of Revelation 13, it speaks like a lamb, it, it, it looks like a lamb, but speaks like a dragon in verse 11. And it causes all to, uh, to worship the first beast, which is papal Rome, and kills those who do not. Here we see again reinforced the fact that uh, military authority combined with religious political uh, power will be combined together to be able to uh, eliminate, to eliminate, to kill those that do not follow uh, in the policies and laws that are made by these powers. Uh, it's interesting to note that all of the Protestant reformers, all of the leaders, the, Martin Luther, uh, John Wesley, uh, Wycliffe, all of the Protestant uh, reformers believe the same thing, that the beast, that Rome was the beast, of Revelation 13, and today, through penetration and infiltration of all the theological seminaries and teachings that have come out of Rome, uh, most denominations today ha have failed to understand properly what their own pioneers, what their own founders used to teach clearly. But the Seventh-day Adventist Church clearly understands and must clearly teach the Advent message, which is the message, the Protestant message, that Rome is the beast of Revelation, and there's a second power given to the remnant church as well, to an understanding of how the United States and Rome will combine together. Many will be beheaded for not receiving an, uh, the mark of the beast. Revelation 24 says that those that were, John saw the souls of those that were beheaded for not receiving the mark of the beast. We're not talking past. We're not talking the Middle Ages. We're talking the, during the last events of earth's history while the mark of the beast is being... Uh, being received by the multitudes, there, many will be beheaded. It's not a surprise that, that uh, many, many shipments of guillotines have been shipped into this country and other countries. One of, one of our uh, colleagues in Mexico happened to be in a place when, when, they, were, when uh, they were offloading a truck, and he noticed that there were hundreds of guillotines inside the truck, and they looked at him, and he left right away. They, well, they didn't want any witnesses. But... But that's the case is we already know what's going to happen. The Bible already told us we don't have, even if we didn't know that, we would still know it's true, that there will be many martyrs and many will be beheaded, be beheaded by the United States and other powers under the influence of Rome and a fallen Protestantism. Here's a quote from, uh, from the fifth volume of Testimonies, page 451. When Protestantism, Protestantism shall unite with the Roman power and clasp hands with spiritualism, and shall repudiate every principle of the Constitution, which is what is happening today, what has happened already uh, under the Patriot Act. Much of our Constitution and our rights that have been given to us by the Constitution have been uh, repudiated. The time will have come for the marvelous workings of Satan, and the end is near. Well, none of us can deny that Rome and the United States have already clasped hands. In fact, they've done more than clasped hands. They're in bed together. And uh, all we need is Protestant, uh, fallen Protestantism to join with them. And pretty well they have joined. Pretty well all the leaders, um, including many leaders in our own church, have united with Rome and, and, the, and, uh, and become uh, unfortunately linked and leagued with uh, the papal power, the harlot, and thus become the daughter of harlot, of a harlot and the, the daughters of the harlot. And we have to be very careful in the and the relationships we form. Uh, if you have a relationship with a harlot, it is called adultery. And if you have a relationship, a formal relationship with a spiritual harlot, it is called spiritual adultery. 
So be very careful who you align yourself with. Be sure you align yourself with God's faithful people, those that, those that uh, believe in the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, have the spirit of prophecy, and teach the three angels' messages. Those are your companions that you will share eternity with. Uh, another key player is God's remnant people. We first had Rome, then we had the United States, and they've already joined. Uh, when when uh, we'll see some of the things we'll discuss in a minute, how they have joined and what parts uh, Rome has conquered in the United States. But the third player that's very, very important, the, the third main player is God's remnant people, the God's pure bride. Uh, God intended his church to be, according to Ephesians 5.27, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, holy and without blemish. Um, a revival of primitive godliness is what God expects in his church. Uh, a special work of purification and putting away of sin is to be seen in a church. Pre preparation by studying the word of God, striving to conform their lives to its precepts. The Elijah message, repentance, temperance in all things, dress reform. You know, you know in dress reform, uh, if you dress like the world, you really are, cannot be part of Elijah message. How can you be part of the Elijah message while you watch the entertainment of the world, while you read, listen to, uh, and discuss and live and breathe the entertainment of the world? How can you be part of the Elijah message when you eat like the world, you think like the world, you act like the world? There has to be reform. There has to be temperance. There has to be reformation. And that involves the way you dress. That involves the obedience to God's laws, his statutes, and his judgments, which are clearly in Malachi 4, part of the Elijah message. Why are we to study history? Very important. We, we're told uh, just, uh, uh, just in society, we're told that if you don't study history, you are doomed to repeat it. Well, that's exactly uh, what is going to happen. Apostle Paul says, Now all these things happen to us for examples and are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And a messenger from heaven was presenting many things, says Sister White, and his message was this, History is being repeated. That which, that which has been will be again. So with this clear leading from Scripture and the spirit of prophecy, let's look at some of the parallel events in history. We have to connect the dots. What happened in the past, compare it with what is happening right now, and finding out, is there a relationship? Can we learn anything? Remember, those who learn, do not learn from history are condemned to repeat it again. And unfortunately, we don't learn very well from history, but the wise will understand, and I want to be part of the wise. So let's look at some events in past history, especially in Rome and God's people Israel. And this is where, over the last several months, God has been showing me uh, understanding what has happened in the past and then pointing me to the present and saying, look, see the connection? And I, I just want to share those with you. Let's look at that uh, back in uh, AD, AD 66. In AD 66, uh, within that, last, with that one generation, Jesus was talking about within this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. He was talking about two events. He was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and he was talking about the very last generation existing during the end of time. But now, now let's look at what happened with Jerusalem. In AD 66, Cestus uh, attacked. He wasn't very experienced. He didn't have a, a lot of experience in this. He made some severe mistakes. He put all his supplies at the back. They were attacked. He lost nearly 6,000 men. And, and, and after nine days of siege, he suddenly retreated and he left. Uh, he left Jerusalem. This was the sign that the apostles were looking for, the sign that God's people needed in order to escape. As soon as Rome left, all the Christians seeing the sign that when Rome steps in, it is a sign from God. And they left Jerusalem, and not a single Christian lost their life when three and a half years later, uh, General Titus came back and destroyed uh, Jerusalem. What's interesting is uh, Cestus came during during the fall of 66. And then Titus came back in the spring. During the, uh, just, he caught him just a few days before, before the Passover. And he caught all the Jews inside the city. And uh, uh, that was exactly three and a half years later. And it, from fall to the spring. And of course, we know the sad story of millions of Jews 
uh, crosses were all over the darkened the hillsides. So many thousands were crucified and then murdered and killed during that because of that rebellion they had against Rome. And so we can see here that uh, this is what God showed me in the order. He showed me, first of all, that what happened in the past is going to be repeated. And, and then that's what happened with Rome. Now we'll come back and let's look at what happened in the church. The next thing that God showed me, connected the dots for me, was Jerusalem. Jesus came in on Sunday on a triumphal entry. As he came down riding the donkey and the people were shouting and, and praising the son of David and singing Hosanna as the children, uh, he stopped. Jesus stopped on the hill uh, of overlooking Jerusalem. And as he looked over Jerusalem, uh, he, he started to cry. It says, uh, when the fast westering sun should pass from the sight in the heavens, Jerusalem's day of grace would be ended, says the desire of ages, pages 577. This was, he was, Jesus was coming to the 70th week. In the middle of the week, he began the week with three and a half years of ministry, and he had come to the end of his three and a half year ministry. Uh, and he was only days away from the crucifixion. It was Sunday, and it was only a few days. The Lamb of God was about to be chosen. And that night, he was to be selected as the sacrificial Passover lamb. And as he looked over there, it says, when the sun was to set, Jerusalem's day of grace would be ended. Another passage in, in Great Controversy says, when he was crucified, Jerusalem's day of mercy was finished. That doesn't mean that the 70 weeks was over. God still protected uh, Israel for another three and a half years until the, uh, until the stoning of 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 Stephen in AD 34, which is when the 70 weeks finished, 490 years was finished, and Jerusalem, Israel, was no longer considered the people of God. But Jerusalem made its decision three and a half years before, and God recognized that decision even before the 70 weeks were finished. And the day of mercy was finished for Jerusalem. They had, they had closed their door of mercy. Uh, the stoning of Stephen uh, signifies a time when the Jews finally sealed their rejection of the gospel and the disciples were scattered abroad by persecution. So we have a three and a half year period of Jesus' ministry followed by a three and a half year period of, of the gospel going to individual Jews, giving them an opportunity to accept the message before it went to the rest of the world. Now, that, that's past history. We, we know that already. Now we're looking at what's going to happen in the future or what is happening today. So when God connected the dots for me and I understood uh, what happened with Rome and I understood what happened with Jerusalem, then God said, now let's look at what's happening in Rome today and let's look at what is happening in the church today. So let's, see, let's, let's look at these two again, uh, Rome and the spiritual Israel today, and let's see what, we can, uh, what dots we can connect. Remember again, we're just looking at evidence and trying to analyze it to see what we can learn uh, that will reveal to us what is happening. It is an understanding. It's not prophesying so much what will happen in the future as it is understanding what is happening in the present. And God gave us prophecy to understand and to be wise and to be awake and not be surprised. It is not God's intention, we learned, uh, for us to be surprised. Okay, let's look at modern developments in Rome. The healing of the deadly wound is almost complete. Uh, we can see the Pope surrounded by all of the presidents and leaders, uh, executive officers in Europe. They all came uh, to, to the Vatican and they all pledged their allegiance. And basically, even recently, uh, uh, recently they just had another meeting and they're calling for the Pope to be the world president. Uh, that, that was proposed and moved. The time will come when Rome will be the world leader and all of the kings of the earth will once again uh, bow in allegiance to the Pope and will follow his instruction of the great beast power that is riding the nations. Just this last week, it was announced that North Korea is asking uh, for a meeting in the Vatican uh, and the president is going to the Vatican. Imagine a communist country so hostile to the Christian religion and in North Korea for 11 years in a row has been voted the most the country most hostile and most, um, uh, where most persecution occurs against Christians. Being a Christian is an automatic death sentence. And, and, uh, and yet, 
Here he's asking for a meeting with the Pope. He's under pressure, and he knows where to go. Because if he can meet with the Pope, the Pope can influence the world leaders, and a, a compromise can be discovered. So the whole world is now beginning, even North Korea, to wonder after the beast. When, when, when Rome came on September 23 to Washington, I say that it invaded because it went right into Congress, then it went into the executive branch, that's a, the legislative branch, then it went into the executive, and it went into the White House, and it spoke to all of the, it spoke to all of the uh, 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 citizens directly from the upper window of the White House, and uh, it came on the Day of Atonement, September 23 of 2015. It took over the legislative, executive. Today, we just voted another, uh, not today, but this last week, uh, uh, one more Catholic Supreme Court justice. So there are no Protestants on the court anymore. One Jew and the rest of them are Catholic. They took over our judicial, and they've been uh, controlling the economy already for a long time. So basically, the Pope came to Washington and invaded the United States and then left. Having just looked at what Rome is doing today, let's take a look at what God's people are doing, what the church is doing. Let's back up a little bit to, to a, a few years, to, the, to 2015. Uh, I was there at the General Conference session in San Antonio, and uh, it was, I always love going to General Conference sessions. I meet a lot of friends. But instead of standing at a booth and meeting people, I was impressed by the Lord just to spend time listening to what was happening. So I, I sat there the whole week and just listened to what was happening in the business session and so on. Uh, while all the eyes were focused on, on the vote on women's ordination, and after that, everybody went their own way. Few noticed that there were some vital changes made to our fundamental beliefs uh, the next few days uh, after, after the midweek there, the Thursday and Friday. Uh, one of the changes that was made is for 150 years we have believed and taught that the spirit of prophecy is a continuous source of truth for the church, a guiding light, an inspired source of uh, prophetic material that we can use uh, as a guide, just as we use the Bible to give us doctrinal guidance. We use the spirit of prophecy to give us day-by-day -day guidance and help uh, show us the way so that we do not uh, fall into deception and to help guide us through the difficult, to the white waters ahead and giving a health message as well. But... During that general conference, there was two proposals made. One is to, to change the wording so that the spirit of prophecy no longer would be considered a source of light. And uh, the second one was the second coming, the imminent coming, which for over 150 years, that has been the Advent message, the midnight cry, the bridegroom is coming, let us go forth to receive him. Both of those were proposed to be changed, so instead of an imminent coming of Jesus, we would be believing in a soon coming of Jesus, which could be... Uh, Soon, it could be relatively soon. Uh, it could be hundreds of years from now. And both of those were proposed as changes. There was some opposition made. The chairman gave everybody an opportunity to express themselves. There was a vote taken. And the vast majority of delegates uh, approved the changes so that the Seventh-day Adventist Church no longer has in its fundamental beliefs uh, the spirit of prophecy as a source of truth, at least not considered it inspired anymore. And uh, Jesus' second coming is no longer imminent as far as the official uh, church position. Uh, I was there. I noted, sadly, those changes. But I did not realize the implication, the important, importance of those decisions until this year when it became uh, clear to me as God pointed out and connected the dots for me, as we would say. Uh, other other the interesting developments in the world church was the Ellen G. White estate, which is which manages the writings of Ellen G. White for release to the public and puts them in ordered forms and publishes the books and electronic media and so on. It's interesting to note that on July 2015, just a few days after the vote was taken to, to disconnect from the spirit of prophecy as an inspired source, they released a new, uh, a, a new release from, from the... Uh, manuscripts of Ellen G. White, in which uh, a letter to Brother Butler from June 6 of 1875. And here's what she said. I am now of the opinion that the testimonies will not live among God's people. They will be removed. I have some light on this point, but I cannot now give it. 
I said, Christ, I have many things to say unto you, but I cannot bear, but you cannot bear them now. So Sister White came to the conclusion quite a long time before she passed away that the church would take an official stand to remove their position and to remove the testimonies. But that was not known by the church until just a few days after the general conference position. I think that A.G. White Estate probably felt like they should release that, uh, seeing that the position had already been taken and prophecy had been fulfilled. Now, I'm going to now back up. We have Rome in the past. We have Rome in the present. We have the, the church taking a very clear position, the Advent movement, and now the church at present taking a position a few steps back on their basic beliefs on the imminent coming, which is the fundamental beliefs. That's why we're called Adventist. It's the imminent coming of Jesus Christ, the imminent advent of Jesus Christ. And uh, the Advent people have a sign, and that is the spirit of prophecy, the testimonies. Well, at this point, uh, we have rejected them as inspired writings, so uh, we're in really hot water right now. Um, and I, I, I saw it as a sad event, but now we're going to look at what what, uh, what implications there might be. In the year 2015, in February, um, I received a phone call, and somebody said, David, the Lord would like to tell you the following. Well, I'm a little reluctant to hear, not to hear, but to, to accept without filtering uh, something that somebody says, I have a message from God for you. But I listened, and it was from God. I think it applies to all of us. David, I have a lot to teach you, but I need to spend more time with you. Well, that's true for all of us. And I accepted it, and I said, Lord, please forgive me. I'm so busy. I'm working in so many countries, but I do want to spend as much time as you need with me. I want to learn. And over a period of months, God began to show me things. But I did not at that time realize this was part of what God was planning to show me. Later, I discovered as I connected all the, the dots that it all made sense, and I could see the, the string of, of uh, information all made sense. In April, on April 30 of 2015, a friend of mine received a, a very a consecrated uh, Bible scholar, a physician that has published some works on, on Bible prophecy and, and still writes uh, authoritative papers on uh, academic papers on it. Uh, he wrote to me and said, David, I, I had a dream last night, April 30 of 2015. And the voice said to me, in yet five months and I will... I will purify the tribe of Levi. I went back and read it just the other day as I prepared for this, and it refers to Malachi 3, 3, God's promises to purify. And we're talking about right before the Elijah message, there's a purification process, and the tribe of Levi has to be referred to the, 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 the people that are elected of God to work in the sanctuary, to handle the sacred things. Uh, and, and God would do a, a special purification process. And he said, I've added the five months up, Biblical, biblical, uh, biblical five months, and it comes out to the Day of Atonement, September 23. I don't know what it means, but I believe that God is going to do something special on September 23 of 2015. Uh, it happens that that day was also the day the Pope arrived in North America, which is not an accident. I believe God allowed the Pope to come on that day, but not before, and that day was... That was the day that the Pope had to arrive in Washington. Uh, on July, July um, 9 and 10 of this year, 2015, um, uh, of the year 2015, the General Conference, of course, made the decisions on the spirit of prophecy and the imminent coming, which I have just discussed. Uh, and we lost those two basic fundamental beliefs from the official position of the church. Of course, I haven't changed, and thousands in Israel haven't changed, but the official position of the organized church is uh, to reject the imminent coming of Jesus Christ and to reject the spirit of prophecy as an inspired source of truth. So that happened July 9 and 10, uh, as best I can recall from the, from the calendar. Uh, September 19 uh, was another day, very interesting. I made a video. I recorded the video because the Lord showed me that as things are beginning to happen, like this was just a few days before the Pope's arrival and the, and the Day of Atonement. He showed me that something was going to happen on the Day of Atonement. And as things move forward on earth, they're also moving forward in heaven. And I looked through my videos that I recorded and on YouTube uh, there, I found the video dated September 19, in which I recorded 
the following, stating that the, if things are moving forward on earth, then on heaven things are moving forward, and the only thing that we can know that's going to move forward in heaven, we're in the middle of the investigative judgment, the judgment of the dead, and that the only thing that could move forward would be uh, moving forward now to the living. And so I, I said, let's keep our eyes open. I can't say for sure. We'll have to watch and see. But uh, that is what I believe is beginning to happen. Some of my friends agreed with me. Some disagreed. No, the Sunday law is the beginning of the judgment of the living. I've done some research on it. Actually, the Sunday law does begin the judgment of the living uh, for the world. But, but there is a previous preparation and judgment on God's people that has to take place because when the Sunday law comes, it's not the beginning. It is the closing time for God's remnant people. The Sunday law is when, when they already have to be ready because they, they have to be, uh, they have to be uh, uh, the chaff has to be separated from the wheat and then they have to go receive the Holy Spirit, latter rain, and they have to go out in a loud cry. And then the rest of the world their judgment takes place. But the church's judgment has to take place before because there's a preparation process. And so over the years I've studied it, i become more convicted that something was happening. But this year is when I became fully convinced. And I'll share that with you here. On, on September 23, the Pope invades Washington and it, uh, and, uh, on the Day of Atonement. Now, here is my conviction that this year, the last several the last several months while I was in Europe preaching and visiting projects in seven countries of Europe, I began to understand different things and I understood almost all of it until I got back to the U.S. There was still a piece or two missing and during the next week or so the Lord uh, showed me the rest of the evidence for that. Let me share with you what, what um, I've observed. These are, these are the conclusions that I've observed, the parallels. In the year 2018, uh, uh, there is a similar similarity with Rome. Rome's attack in the fall of 66, a withdrawal, and a returning back in AD 70 in the spring is an exact parallel to what is happening today with Rome and, and the U.S. here uh, in, uh, in their relationship. Uh, Rome came in the fall, just like 66 AD, came in the fall in 2015 to North America. It had an initial uh, entrance. Uh, was, the doors were all open. President Trump went to the Vatican. Uh, President Obama has gone to the Vatican also several times. President Trump told the Pope, uh, I will do whatever you say. And uh, so basically the executive, legislative, and judicial branches were taking over at that time. And, uh, and then they left. Their influence did not leave, but Everybody was left in peace. We've been able to preach. Liberties in the country continued. And those that made their preparations, those that have, have decided to follow the Lord's leading, have been able to do so. Just like in Israel of old, uh, Christians were allowed to leave the city. There was no obstacles to them leaving. So when Rome came back three and a half years later, there was not a single Christian lost their life in, in Jerusalem. Well, <clears throat> the spring of 2005, the fall of 2015, Three and a half years later is the spring of 2019, just a few months away. And it is my conviction, it is my conviction that something is about to happen and that it will happen in the spring of 2019. The second attack of Rome will begin. And this time it's in serious. And this time it's going to involve uh, legislation, it's going to involve destruction, it's going to involve the loss of life. And something is going to happen. In fact, I'm not just saying it because I have a conviction. I've been able to have evidences piling up all around me from things that, uh, uh, from publications, from words, from comments of some very high-level Catholics, as well as, as, well as dreams and, and uh, comments from people who have received communications, plus the Word of God, from, plus talking to a pastor friend of mine who from Scripture has determined the same thing. Uh, I will let him explain his, he will at some point release it, all the whole series, but right now uh, we will make available uh, at the end here uh, how you can watch those two to see how Scripture corroborates the, these, these events. And so something is going to happen in the March and April of 2019. You can say, 
Oh, we've been waiting for a long time. There's no Sunday law in the pipeline. Nothing is happening. The Sunday law has been there ever since 2015. And after that, uh, it's, dis it's disguised as a uh, law of the environment. Uh, one of my friends from Guyana was a delegate to the International United Nations uh, meetings that they had in Europe and regarding the environment. And he came back and he told me that uh, everything about those laws involves the uh, Sunday, the, the placing of Sunday as a day of family worship, uh, enforceable with penalties. And uh, then later when the Pope came to Washington, uh, also I, uh, some of our friends went there and they talked with some bishops and cardinals who came to see them as they were distributing great controversies. Uh, and uh, they also received the confirmation from, from uh, the Catholic priests that the Dominis Dies and other literature on the environment is really a disguised Sunday law. And the, the, the bishop said, young man, you're very observant. That is exactly what it's about. So when we think there's no Sunday law, we're blind. When we think nothing has happened, it's already in place. It's just a matter of enforcing it. All the nations of the earth have already dealt with it. Uh, they, they have already, as the United Nations, have already agreed how to enforce it. It's just waiting an opportunity for God to, to release the winds, and then it will happen. And I believe it will happen in March or April from the parallels. That is my conviction. Let's assume it doesn't happen. Praise the Lord. Let's assume that we have more time. Praise the Lord. But I'm not making that assumption because the parallels that God has shown me tells us that we need to be ready. And if I wait until I can see it happening to try to get ready, I'm going to be like the unwise, uh, unwise virgins. I'll start trying to prepare after everybody wakes up to the reality that Jesus is coming. It'll be too late. None of the unwise virgins ever went into the wedding. Only those that prepared before. So now is the preparation time. We have a few months to get ready. That's what Rome is doing. Let's, let's look at some other things that happen now within the church as a parallel. Uh, remember, remember now the decision of the Seventh Adventist Church. The highest body, the highest authority in the Adventist Church is the, the General Conference at session with all the delegates from around the world. And I have known for some time that most of the church membership no longer believed on the imminent coming of Jesus and no longer uh, supported the spirit of prophecy as inspired writings. And, and this was, of course, reflected in the vote that was taken. J just, like, just like when Jesus uh, was rejected by Jerusalem, by Israel, uh, in, in uh, 31 AD, we also broke his heart in 2015. He sent us prophets, and we have rejected it. Sister White said, I am of the opinion that the testimonies will be rejected and removed. And that's exactly what happened in 2015. But the problem is, the implication is this. The last remnant people of God have, have a sign. According to Revelation, they, have, they keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. The, when they voted to remove the spirit of prophecy as inspired writings, they lost the sign. We as a people, organized church, we lost the one sign that makes us the remnant people of God. Of course, those that still believe haven't lost it, but those that voted to, to reject it, which is the majority of the world church through their delegates, lost the status of remnant people of God. I'm, I praise the Lord that within the church there are still thousands and hundreds of thousands maybe that still believe in the imminent coming of Jesus and the spirit of prophecy. But... The rejection as a spirit of prophecy is a rejection of the sign of a people of God. And the loss of the imminent coming of Jesus as a central part of our message is the loss of the midnight cry. What's the midnight cry? It's when the ten virgins were sleeping at midnight, there was a cry heard. The bridegroom is coming. Let us go forth to meet him. If you don't have that message, we are told that their feet are left. Those who reject that message, their feet are left in perfect darkness and they will soon fall off the path. So those two changes that we did in 2015 reflect a rejection of the, of the messages, a rejection of the belief uh, that Jesus is coming soon. That's what Adventism is all about. It's about preparing the world for Jesus' imminent soon return. Now, from the time that Israel rejected their Messiah in, in day AD at the Passover and killed him, 
in AD 31. It was three and a half years later until persecution began. Well, when I saw the parallel, I said, persecution can't begin any Adventist church. Nobody's going to get stoned. The church cannot imprison anybody. The Seventh Adventist church is not going to stone anybody. How could persecution begin? I don't see the parallel, Lord. Well, several weeks went by until I arrived in uh, the United States. And then uh, I had the chance of meeting a union president that just came back from the division meetings. And uh, uh, actually, actually, he was speaking to a friend of mine and shared with my, the friend of mine uh, this, this information. And that was, he said, have you heard what's about to happen in, in, in October 14 to 17 at the annual council when all of the delegates from around the world, the union presidents, meet together to handle church business. Uh, we've been told by the General Conference Administration that policies will be put in place that will allow the General Conference Administration to discipline anybody to control the memberships, control the ordinations of the pastors around the world. That will give them all of the clout that they need to discipline some of the rebel divisions. And and evidently, that's going to happen. In fact, while I'm making this video, it's happening. Uh, th this, uh, this, these next few days are going to be the time when it's taken to vote. And uh, I believe it's this coming Sunday. But, but we'll find out soon. Uh, we have friends at the annual council that will be letting us know. And, uh, and so when that happens, that will place into the hands of a few men and women the ability to control the membership of anybody in the world, uh, all the members. Normally, historically, uh, the church congregations control the membership of the individual members, and the unions control the membership of the, I mean, the ordinations of the pastors. And that is as it, as it should be. It's decentralized. When you put the control of your conscience in the hands of a few people, you get the same thing as Rome. You get abuse and persecution. You get threatenings. You obey me or else. And that's exactly what is about to happen. When I understood that, I made the connection. Persecution is going to break out in the church. Persecution is going to take place. People will be threatened. Already this has happened at, a, at lower levels. But at a world level, it hasn't happened yet because they didn't have the power. But in a few days, they will have the power to control and threaten and to to disfellowship anybody in the world. That means division presidents, union presidents, conference presidents, uh, ch church members. Uh, if they don't obey human authority, they can be disciplined and disfellowship. So here we have two parallels. Rome, in the past, three and a half years later, three, comes 66, attacks and destroys in three and a half years later. Then we have Rome in the present, comes into Washington in uh, the September of the fall of 2015, and, in, and will come and destroy three and a half years later. Uh, we have the church rejecting Christ in 31 AD, persecution beginning uh, in AD 34, three and a half years later. We have the church rejecting basic fundamental beliefs regarding who we are as a, as a people and our sign as a remnant people of God and rejecting the imminent coming and the spirit of prophecy. And three and a half years later, uh, persecution is a, a type of persecution is about to begin. So uh, why would God allow that to happen? Well, it fits perfectly. You see, this is called a shaking. We've been living in a shaking time. In a shaking time, God's people have to make choices. You have to choose sides. Do you have a, do you have a, a, a belief system? Do you understand the Advent message? Do you understand where we came from and where we're going? Do you accept the sanctuary? Do you accept what Jesus is doing in the most holy place? Do you, do you understand the message we have, the importance we have, the mission of preparing the world for Jesus' coming? Or have you just said, times are different. Everything is different. What we believe before doesn't matter. And, you, and, you go, and slowly but surely, there's been the two groups developed in the church, but there's still a lot of people in the middle. They still mix a lot. Well, that has to change. Before the winds of persecution can come, these two groups that are in the middle have to be able to be up, uh, put apart, which means the, the threat of, of being disfellowshipped and disciplined uh, is the last event that causes people to choose sides. I will be loyal to God or I will be loyal to man. And, and that is as it should be. It's painful. 
It's uh, something you wish didn't have to happen, but before the winds of persecution hit, everybody has to be on one side or the other. The chaff and the wheat have to be separated. And the sad thing is, and it makes me cry to think about it, is that families will be divided. Uh, the majority of the church has always gone with, uh, with human authority. Uh, a smaller group will go with divine authority. Whatever it is, their conscience will not be affected. They will be loyal to God regardless. But that is as it should be, because when the winds of persecution come, and as we know, uh, Rome is going to be enforcing laws, and the United States is going to be enforcing laws, and eventually it'll become a universal uh, uh, a Sunday law in which it, even a death sentence will be passed uh, against those that refuse to comply. And if you, if you always obey what man says in hum, human authority, and you give in just for your own comfort, and so nobody uh, will say anything, and just so you will be more comfortable, you're going to continue right with, with uh, Sunday laws and obey them. Those that are loyal to God in the small persecution will also be loyal to God in the big one. So we're going to be facing some very tough times, but the persecution from the church is only a dividing that God is allowing uh, so that people will choose sides. And then soon after, when the human laws and civil laws are applied, then there will be a separation of those that have chosen human authority from divine authority, and then God can pour out his Holy Spirit and the loud cry can begin. I do not wish anybody to lose family. I pray for my children. I pray for my brothers, sisters, and family. I pray for my coworkers and their families. And I know it's a time of agonizing and prayer. We have to make sure that we're ready, first of all. And then we have to make sure that our families are ready and to share this. If, if you do not believe anything is going to happen, then probably you won't be prepared. But uh, I'll give you some advice. Uh, God is not going to lose anybody who wants to know the truth. God is not going to allow anybody to be lost that is awake and begging for light. So we can be, uh, we can be at peace if we are talking to God and asking him for direction. Because it's not about... It's not about this presentation. It's not about me. God's going to have to convict everybody with the reality of the situation very soon. I believe there's going to be events in the world. In fact, yesterday, uh, uh, markets begin to, to uh, collapse and to crash. I believe God is going to allow greater uh, evidences that something is happening. before. It. He's not going to catch us by surprise, and we'll learn that. Let us continue. The investigative judgment began in October 22 of 1844 with the judgment of the dead. The Seventh-day Adventist churches firmly rooted on that uh, date when Jesus entered the most holy place to begin the cleansing of the sanctuary. It begins, uh, that the judgment of the dead began then, but the judgment of the living had to begin at some point, and here's where it begins. When the judgment of the living begins, it begins with the house of God, leadership first, and then church members. And it continues in with the rest of the world and the loud cry. Uh, 1 Peter 4.17 says, uh, But the time has come that the judgment must begin at the house of God. And Ezekiel 4 tells us that when the, when the judgment begins and a seal is placed on the foreheads of men that sigh and cry for the abominations, they begin at the ancient men which were before the house. So our leaders uh, were the first to to have the focus of God turned on them, and then it, it, it turns to the membership. Uh, I don't know where the dividing point is. We must be very, very close, but we, but we as the church members uh, must pray for our leaders, but then we must pray for ourselves too. And uh, let's look at the ten virgins. I'll, you, you know the, the story of the ten virgins. Uh, they went forth to meet the bridegroom, which means uh, they're Adventists. They're, they're waiting for the advent of the bridegroom. And it says, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. So we have a condition of the whole entire church uh, sleeping and not awake, not recognizing what is happening. At midnight, there was a cry made, behold, the bridegroom cometh, let us go forth to meet him. They all woke up, and that's when the foolish discovered they didn't have enough oil. It was at the wake-up call that you discover if you have oil or don't have oil. They tried to borrow some, but they said, no, go buy for yourself. Go to, go to them that sell, and buy for yourself. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went into the marriage, and the door was shut. If you continue reading the story, you discover that 
they were not allowed in. And after the door is shut, none of God's people that were foolish and did not make preparations, none of them will be allowed in. This is probably the most tragic, mind-boggling agony I could even imagine. To have known the truth, to have grown up in the truth, to understand this, the, the Advent message, to understand the sanctuary service, but just to be careless, just to, be, just, just to listen to others. No, there's nothing to worry about. It's a long time. We don't have to do anything. And if you listen to them, you will lose your soul. We will see, as Sister White told us, the same thing. Only if you prepare and have oil in your lamp, which is the early rain, which is the, the outpouring of God's power to, to bring us to repentance, to be able to correct our faults, to be able to wipe away all worldliness, uh, to confess our sins, and to prepare the way for the king's highway uh, so that he can come. Only those who have done that preparation can receive the latter rain after they go into the, to the banquet uh, and go into the wedding. The close of probation for all mankind uh, will happen, and the probation will continue and end shortly before the appearing of the Lord Jesus in the clouds of glory. And it will be declared that those that are unjust will be unjust still, and those that are righteous will be righteous still. But, but there is a, there's a work to do before. Here's, there's a door that closes for God's people, but remains open. Look what it says here. In Last Day Events, page 182, the time of God's destructive judgments is a time of mercy for those that have had no opportunity to learn what is truth for the rest of the world. As the judgments are falling, they're looking for answers. Tenderly will the Lord look upon them. His heart of mercy is touched. God is a merciful God. He wants to save everybody. His hand is still stretched out to save while the door is closed to those that would not enter. You see, there is a closed door that happens to those that know the truth. And that, that door, when it closes, like it did for, for Noah's Ark, those that were outside remained outside. And those that were in remained inside. And that's why I'm preaching this message today. I'm presenting this message with a heart cry that you will be prepared from now. Maybe you already are. Praise the Lord. And if you're not, if you were careless, if you were asleep, if you were comfortable, wake up. We have only a few months to get ready. And, and that getting ready time is also to share with our family members. Uh, I came to the U.S. with my wife because we have family members that we want to share this message with. We have already shared it with some of our children, uh, brother and sister-in-laws. We have other family members to share it with. There is no time. This is an urgent message. Everybody must get ready. And if God were to give us more time, it's okay. We're ready. But if, if we do not present this message and a door closes, people will turn to us and say, you knew and you didn't tell us? So we have finally arrived at a time. And, and there, there will not be any delay. The Lord said, there comes a time when he says, I will no longer delay. The vision will not be postponed. And that's where we are now. There is no more delay. And you might say, I don't see it happening. Get ready anyway. But I don't understand. Get ready anyway. But I don't believe it's going to be that short. Get ready anyway. God, you see, God always warns. Always warns. The Lord God will do nothing without first revealing it to his servants of prophets. Amos 3, 7. Noah preached for 120 years. The rejection of Israel, of their Messiah, didn't happen by accident. God gave them 490 years to know what was happening in the 70-week prophecy of Daniel. Nineveh, Jonah preached for 40 days, and they repented, and they, they were given warning. They were, they were pagan. They could, God could have ignored them. He could have just destroyed them. But no, he gave them an opportunity. The investigative judgment, when it began, 11 years, 1833 to 1844, they were given an opportunity to preach it all around the world. Jesus' second coming, the loud cry will cover the earth. God is not going to do anything without first revealing it to his servants. And such something so important as our names coming up in judgment, the judgment of the living, God's not going to catch us by surprise. You're going to see this message echoed from all across the world in every language. Before God closes that door, you are going to be given an opportunity to put your life right with the Lord. He's not going to surprise you unless you just tune it out, unless you listen to those that say, oh, don't worry, this is just a fanatical message. God will give you an opportunity. What you do with it, it's a different story. Would not he warn us before our names come up in judgment? He will, and he is.
Get ready, get ready, get ready. I saw that the remnant were not prepared for what is coming upon the earth. Stupidly like lethargy seems to hang upon the minds of most who profess to believe that we are and what um, believe that we are having the last message. My accompanying angel cried out with solemn, awful solemnity, get ready, get ready, get ready for the fierce anger of the Lord is soon to come. His wrath is to be poured out unmixed with mercy and you are not ready. Legions of angels are around you and trying to press their awful darkness that ye might be ensnared and taken. You suffer your minds to be diverted too readily from the work of preparation and the all-important truths for these last days. Does that describe you? We have legions of angels pressing around us. Too much work to do. Too many other things. Even in God's work, we get so busy. Get ready, get ready, get ready. I want to be ready. <clears throat> in Ellen G. White's time, she said, it is a solemn statement that I make to the church that not one in 20 whose names are registered upon the books of the church are prepared to close their earthly ministry. Not one in 20. I wonder if it's any better today. I wonder if it's worse today. My opinion is that it's much, much worse than one in 20. With all the worldliness, the thousands that have been baptized with no preparation, some never heard of the sanctuary, some never heard of the health message, some never even heard about tithing and offering. They were just baptized in mass. In many countries, I lived in South America for many years. I've worked and preached in more than 100 countries. There, there are countries where you baptize 20 and 30,000 at a time. Where are they today? They were never well rooted. They didn't understand the message. Most of them just go out the back door. But uh, they will receive the plagues just as verily as the churches who oppose the law of God. Last day events 172. This is very solemn. What if only one in a hundred is ready today? That means out of a congregation of 500, maybe five, maybe 10. Once you find out, once somebody finds out, that they're on the outside and there's no getting in. There's going to be loud wailing heard in every direction. It was, they will, they will, they will talk to their pastors and their leaders. It was you who kept me from receiving the truth that would have saved me from this awful hour. The people turned to, upon their ministers with bitter hate and reproached them saying, you have not warned us. You told us that the world was to be converted and cried, peace, peace to quiet every fear that was aroused. You told us not, you told us not of this hour. Those who warned us of it, you declared to be fanatics and evil men who would ruin us. But I saw that the minister did not escape the wrath of God. Their suffering was tenfold greater than that of the people. You see, if you're a messenger of God, if you're a watchman on the wall, you better be found faithful because God will hold you accountable. And if you prepare people, God will reward you greatly. But if you, if you teach them to resist, and those that are warning of Jesus coming, and those that are going to you and saying, I've heard this message, what do I do? Oh, don't worry about it, everything is normal, Jesus is not coming for a long time, nothing is happening, there's no, there's no Sunday law in the pipeline, nothing is about to happen, and they believe you, and they are lost, they will turn on reproach and their blood will be on your hands. Brothers and sisters, don't trust human beings, don't trust any leader, any pastor, don't just trust me. You cannot trust a human being. You have to go to God with this message and let God tell you. Let God confirm for you. So let me summarize the events in this message. Let me just summarize it for you. On September 23, 2018, on that Day of Atonement, it is my conviction that Jesus, in the most holy place, entered upon the second phase of his judgment, the judgment of the living specifically uh, towards Seventh Avenue, toward his church for a three and a half year period. He began with the leadership of the church and he will finish with each of the church members three and a half years later in the spring of 2019. That is my conviction. Is it, can I say that I know without a doubt? No. Can I say that this is exactly what is happening? That is my belief. That's what I believe and that's what I'm working on and that's what I'm teaching. But, I'm not being dogmatic. And if somebody says, I'm not sure, that's perfectly okay. That's between you and God. But I am doing my duty to convey to you that the door is about to close. And that is my belief and my conviction. And I believe after talking to my pastor friend uh, that I had never talked to before, but we talked together. And he from the book of Daniel 
has done his research and he is absolutely convinced that that is the case. I will give you the links in a few minutes so you can listen to it for yourself. But from the book, from the Bible itself, you can prove that, that that will happen. Uh, number two, on September 23, Rome began its takeover of the American government, legislative, executive, and judicial branches. It already controlled the economy. The Sunday law uh, in the form of environmental laws is already in place. By December, everything will be done with planning. Uh, by spring of 2019, March or April, the final assault will happen on God's law and God's people. And that's where we'll begin. And by the way, interestingly enough, the Bible also talks about a second three and a half year period. And I think if you will listen to the presentations of the pastor that I'm going to, uh, the links I'm going to show you, you will find that there is a second uh, three and a half year period that will happen. And we will pretty well know that we're getting close to Jesus coming and when that happens. So we're getting close. Uh, well, actually, the bridegroom is coming and it's time that we go forth to meet him. Number three, God will allow the United States to enact oppressive laws which as a storm will blow away the chaff. That which is left will be a small minority, but they will press together. They will, they will reorganize uh, into a group of people. They will, they, God will have cleansed them. They have received the early rain, and these will receive the latter rain and will go forward into the loud cry. They will go into the, with the bridegroom to the wedding. Uh, the shaking that has been intensifying, number four, since the last general conference in 2015, leaders who are no longer under the influence of the Holy Spirit have acted with increased hostility. I've seen a lot of changes since 2015. A, a retired conference president just asked me a, a little over a month and a half ago, what is happening to the church? Since the last three years, things have changed so much. Every type of wickedness is allowed to be in the church. The, the, the standards, the worldliness, what is going on? And I had to share with him this message, and it was a very solemn time. He had never considered the possibility that the Holy Spirit has already been withdrawn from those that have been declared uh, uh, wanting. And so those that have acted hostily against those that are preaching and living present truth, and yet they protect and promote worldliness in the church. Number five, the final shaking event will be a type of persecution in which every, every church member will be threatened with either obedience to man's laws inside the church, denominational policies, or else they will be disciplined. And this is happening right as we talk. The events are there, the people are in place, and the authority to do that is already, uh, by next week it should be granted already. And this, the, this will peak around 2019, exactly three and a half years after the general conference session of July. And after that, soon after that, Rome will act. Number six, members fearing to lose their membership and their jobs will rapidly align themselves in obedience with denominational policies. Those who choose to follow their consciences will be disciplined. By their choices, every church member will choose sides. And this is, again, in preparation right before the storm hits. The storm will separate the chaff from the grain and the grain will remain. In mercy, God sent two angels to Lot. Lot had made a lot of bad choices, but even in that mercy, God went to him in, in Sodom, and he told Lot, Escape for thy life, Lot. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in the plain, lest thou be consumed. And I would have the same message. Brother and sister, escape for your life. If you have not prepared, you have a time to escape. You, you, before the destruction comes, you have a time. Escape for thy life. The deadly lethargy of the world is paralyzing senses. Sin is no longer repulsive. The judgments are soon to be poured out. Escape for that life is a warning from the angels of God. Other voices are heard saying, do not become excited. There is no cause for special alarm. Those who are at ease in Zion cry, peace and safety, while heaven declares swift destruction is coming upon a transgressor. At volume 5 of Testimonies, page 233. You will hear both voices. The devil will raise his voice in anger against this message, but it will go out by multiple voices all around the world. If God is truly planning on closing the door, he will make sure everybody gets a chance to hear it, and there will be great hostility from the devil toward this message because he doesn't want God's people to get ready because he knows that that is Satan's worst fear, that God's people will get ready. None of us are yet ready. 
Turn to God while there's still an opportunity. Ask God to clean you from all unrighteousness and selfishness. Ask for the oil of the Holy Spirit to cleanse you, to fill your life. Without it, nobody can enter the wedding. Pray for your loved ones. Share with them the urgency. Take time off to study and pray. Small details are very important. If you live in a city, should I say it? You should have moved out a long time ago. But if you live in a city, move out now. If you stay in, it will cost you your life. Obey what God has told you to do. We are still to work in the cities, but we're not to live in them. So if you ever plan to obey, now you know. It is time now. Become involved in ministry for others. That is going to be your full-time work. And don't be afraid. God will take care of you. God will teach you. What you learn now will be very, very important for what's going to happen next year. You have to learn to trust God sometime. Start now, and he will build your muscles. And, and uh, claim his promises, read his promises, and just trust him. God is going to carry his people through. Get ready, get ready, get ready. No man knoweth, the, listen to this very important quote from the Great Controversy. It applies directly to this. No man knoweth the day or the hour was the argument most often brought forward by rejectors of the Advent message, the Advent truth. In, 18, in the 1800s, whenever they were saying, Jesus is coming, no man knoweth the day or the hour. That's exactly the same argument that can be brought forward today when Jesus is about to come. One saying the Savior must not be made to destroy another. Though no man knoweth the day nor the hour of his coming, we're instructed and required to know when it is near. We are further taught that to disregard this warning and to refuse or neglect to know when the advent is near will be as fatal for us as it was for those who lived in the days of Noah, not to know when the flood was coming. And so... Therefore, we are told by God, watch, watch. And, and Mark 13, what I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. So right now is not a time to sleep. It will be fatal. Wake up and get ready. And you must know when it is near. Uh, some of you will react if you were relaxed and you thought it was a long ways away and suddenly you wake up to this reality. The message will probably shake you up. But don't be worried. This is normal. God, take it to God in prayer. If you fast for three days, um, it's interesting to note I was in the Dominican Republic recently with evangelism, and many of the, many of the members there wanted to know what, how they should react uh, during these times. Some were told uh, not to go to the meetings. Other were, others were invited to go. So they fasted and prayed, but it was on the third day of fasting that they, the majority of them received an answer from God in dreams, in visions, and they were told this was God's work. And then they participated freely. And, uh, and so I would ask you to go to God. Fast and pray. God will definitely uh, reveal to you. Study God's word. Look at the evidences. Pray about it. And don't lean on human opinions. Don't go to somebody. What do you think? Do you think I should or I shouldn't? Human opinion is not going to guide you. It must be God who tells you directly. Go to him. Your life depends on it. But remain humble. Keep a Christian attitude because we have much more to learn yet. And don't, don't allow rumors to destroy uh, your confidence in a message. Go to God and let him tell you what it is. Now, if you're awake, you're wide awake spiritually, you may even resonate with this message and say, God has been telling me the same thing. He's been telling me to get ready, get ready, get ready. I knew he was coming soon. So if you're wide awake, you might already uh, be part of the midnight cry saying, the bridegroom is coming, let us go forth to meet him. Now, there are some of you that will react with anger and become upset. Remember that Satan's worst fear is that God's people will wake up and get ready. And Satan is also angry. And if your immediate response is anger and hostility, I would suggest that your emotions are not under the control of God. They're under the control of Satan. I suggest you kneel down and pray. And you ask God to give you humility and to act like a Christian. Instead of in hostility and anger to fight the message, get on your knees. Let God deal with the message. If it's not God's message, he's going to deal with it. But if you try to deal with anger and trying to destroy the messengers and destroy the message, probably you're not being controlled by God because God never gives emotions like that. So many of you will react in anger and hostility but when that happens, remember that, uh, that it's a sign to you to come, get on your knees and ask God to give you a sweet spirit because 
the, the loud cry, we know that there's going to be much hostility. This is not the loud cry. This is only a beginning cry. This is the midnight cry. The bridegroom is coming. But, it, but if you act hostily to that, you're going to act hostily to the loud cry. And you're going to be on the wrong side. So please, please do not get angry. Please do not get upset. And if you do, then please kneel in prayer. The proper response to this message is humility and going to God and asking him to confirm in your life uh, what, how you should react. Now, I promise to give you some more, uh, ev uh, more uh, links here where you can listen to other messages. Remember, the Bible says in, a, in the mouth of two or three witnesses is a thing established. So you, we can expect this message to come from different uh, uh, directions. There will be dreams, visions, definitely Bible studies, consecrated people lifting up this message. But here it is, two presentations by a pastor friend of mine, and you'll, uh, you'll be blessed to watch these. Uh, they're on your screen. You can just copy them. They're very easy to remember. Uh, and then they'll take them, it'll take you to a YouTube link. And finally, the banquet is ready. The angels have prepared the banquet. Jesus is getting ready to come. I'm excited. I want to go home. I don't know if you want to go home. I do. And the problem for Jesus is that he's been waiting mercifully for years. People say the, bride, the bridegroom has delayed. Uh, why, why has he delayed? It's because he loves his people too much. He hasn't wanted to come earlier because his people were not ready. But the time is running out. The time has come that God must act. And because he has to act, he's allowing this message mercifully to get, get to you so that you can hear this message. And he wants to take us very soon to, to join him in the banquet feast of the Lamb. He's looking forward to his bride and taking her home. I want to be there. We have to be dressed in a white robe of righteousness. Allow God to, to put his robe of righteousness on your life and me on my life. And when, when God looks at us and our name comes up in a judgment, it will be Jesus' perfect robe of righteousness that will be seen, not our filthy rags. May God bless you. I'll be praying for you. And may God uh, give you an opportunity to pray about this. And as you study and pray, I know God will confirm it. And let us stand together, shoulder to shoulder, until Jesus is coming. The best days of the church are straight ahead. God bless you.